Salute. I mean, hello, everyone. What language do I speak? English. Hello. <laughs> hello, Rafael. Salute. Hello. Salute. Ciao. Hello. Ciao a tutti. Hola a todos. Ciao a tutti. Hola. Hola a tutti. I put in a retracted S on my, uh, on my, todos. my, <laughs> on my Sigma. Hold on. I should probably put these in. Let's see. Let's see what this does to the live stream if I do this. That's right. Hmm. Let's see what happens. How, how am I coming <laughs> through? Still being heard? Um, I believe so. For Look me, at that. yes. And I don't even have to try these live streams anymore. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't have to try when I'm with such a tremendous uh, expert and such a, a good friend as you. I know you're you're humble, like oh, I'm not an expert and everything. But no, Raf, um, I've known you uh, for a few years now, and since we met, you have been an incredible help to me. On this specific subject we're going to talk about today, which is um, phonology, pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, you know, you saw videos I was doing in Latin on Scorpio Martianos, and you're like, hey, I love what you're doing, but here's some tips that'll improve what you're doing. And I immediately got better mm. um, and, uh, and have continued, I can't think of a single month um, that we've known each other where you haven't added something really helpful and important to my understanding of phonology or linguistics or language in general. And yeah, I'm not exaggerating everybody. I mean, this, I mean, thank goodness I have this, this amazing friend who's this wonderful teacher of phonetics and phonology and as well as uh, Latin and Spanish and, uh, and Italian. So welcome, Raf. Glad you're here. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. I mean, I like um, your own voice. Thank you there. That was very, thank I, you. I, I think you did that deliberately, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, Just, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I say it the, the weird way. I say thank you, which is, hmm. I, we're, we're, since we're not being prescriptive, right? You taught me not to we're do not that. We're not being prescriptive. Although you, good. you still make fun of me for saying often. but uh, <laughs> I do need to make a video about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, people have probably seen or well, potentially seen me floating around talking about random things in, mm. in various videos. I think we have a video talking about ancient Greek pronunciation. We have a video talking about why Spanish definitely definitely comes from Latin, um, which were super fun to do. But uh, I think maybe some people are wondering, like, who is this person and why is he just randomly appearing in these videos? So um, hello, everyone. I'm Rafael Turrigiano. Um, I just graduated with a degree in linguistics and Japanese. Um, I'm super interested in historical linguistics, uh, historical phonology, and also um, phonology and phonetics as applied to second language learning, which is what we're going to talk about here. Mm. Um, and I also uh, just started teaching lessons online. You can go to my website and see details there. The link is um, in the description, and it's right here on the screen. Yes. So if you get R. Turrigiano, that is... Mm. And that is not unfortunately, but that is a prize. But it is the price of entry. You must be able to spell Turrigiano correctly to enjoy this, this yeah. the, the teaching that this man can and does do. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it can be a struggle, definitely. Um, no worse than mine. So. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I guess we should uh, yeah. get started uh, talking about it. Yeah, I was just going to point out the... Hold on, I'm going to get to video. In case people want to see video that uh, I was just mentioning, um, Raf was um, the the co-developer, if you will, uh, of the Lucian pronunciation, which is meant to be a essentially a, uh, a way to, to, to pronounce ancient Greek, which can satisfy more uh more people i think um but the video explains a lot and you can see you know you can see a lot more about what a raft does and how he uh how he communicates there uh as well as hold on spanish uh, latin hold on i'll just put in this uh, no viene del latin no viene del latin there it is, is that's one with the kitty with the little, spanish little not right. <laughs> yeah those are the ones those are the ones in case you are yes. all interested in it's seeing them. Uh, they're very, I think they're, well, they're really important videos, I think, for this channel. So, uh, yeah, so um, a couple uh, things we'll definitely talk about today. I know you uh, you had some great stuff that I, I'm looking forward to talking about, but one mm -hmm. is Retracted S. In fact, guess who knows about yeah, that's, that? Thank that's you. the only thing we're going to, to talk about. 
always. It's just retracted us. It's a very it's the only the only phonological concept that uh, if if you have one takeaway, it's no, no, I'm I'm kidding. Uh, we will talk about other things. <laughs> I do love talking about retracted us. Though. That's uh, yeah. It's, it's one no, okay, and I, I and I want to mention it because topics. yeah, just because I think it's really I think it's pretty darn important to the way mm -hmm. we might uh, pronounce if we wish to do so in an an, an historical way, being. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Latin and uh, ancient Greek, as well as you know, knowing that just noticing that really critical difference between European Spanish and American Spanish. One one might go to Spain and learn Spanish really well, but never notice that difference, and then always have that little bit of accent. But it's so easy to at least become aware of and then learn. So right, yeah, exactly, and yeah, yeah I mean that's that's sort of the 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 overarching overarching. Uh, Is it arcing topic? or arching? Is it overarching? Overarching. Over. Super Arcaneum. No, that doesn't sound right. I don't know. Two, two native English speakers don't know how to pronounce an English word. Typical. Well, that sounds uh, pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> like another day in the well, land of Anglophones. Yeah. Oh, are we, are we putting on our, our glasses? Okay. I am. Yeah. Cool. I mean, oh, wow. We look great. Like this. <laughs> Hold on. Let, let me zoom in first. Yeah, we look good like this. I agree. But you were saying. Um, yeah. So we're talking about. Um, phonetic awareness and phonological awareness, which are kind of sort of two different things, um, and why we think those are important and why it's worth worrying about, um, which, I mean, of course, Luke, you talk about pronunciation a lot. You spent a lot of time and energy convincing people that pronunciation is important, and I think a lot of people that watch this channel um, believe that to some extent um, or to a large extent. Um, but uh, I think to just sort of demystify a little bit this area of language learning that um, I think a lot of people are just kind of intimidated by, and not just um, learners, but teachers as well are kind of intimidated by, um, when mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it can be very accessible and very beneficial. Mm. Um, so I guess um, if I were to expand on that a little bit, unless you had something to add. Only, only something that I, I want to say for the important part of what we've discussed in, um, actually, do we look better like this? That's okay. Nah, nah, I like this better. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, vote out there if you prefer the zoomed in version. Yeah, zoomed or... <laughs> Let's or, hear uh, your comments. We, uh, uh, but uh, the, um, <laughs> when it comes to pronouncing, a, a modern language is, is different. For example, Italian is a language we both know pretty well and we're familiar with, so we would think, oh, yeah, we should learn standard Italian. But at the same time, inevitably, if we studied, for example, I studied in Florence and I picked up a lot of Florentine speech traits, which I've since mm. tried to reduce to try to s s be more neutral sounding mm. um, in Italian, which is is achievable. But whenever we learn a language, you know, uh, people will say, oh, they prefer the British pronunciation to the American version of, mm. of English or the Australian one, which I think is also before New Zealander. Even Indian, why not? They are all—they're all great. And there was a lot of native speakers who pronounce English in a variety of ways. Scottish, of course, Irish. For them, for them forget you and the Welsh. I think I got them all. Did I get everybody? Okay, good. Um, Canada? Did you say Canada? Darn the Canada! <laughs> I said American, and that's in the Americas. Oh God! <laughs> right? Careful, careful now. In the Americas, yes. It's I'm being inclusive. Yeah. North American, yes. I'm being international. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it's just that. Um, People, I, uh, I think the emotional component, which is inevitable whenever we care about something, an emotional component mm. that goes into um, pronunciation of like one is superior to another is something that is best to not worry too much about. And when it comes to an ancient language, you know, what's right, what's wrong. We've talked often about the debates. Oh, ecclesiastical pronunciation versus classical. I like mm. both and I use both um, more and more regularly, mm. both of them. Uh, the various pronunciations of ancient uh, Greek, as we discussed, that really any of them are fine. The, the only issue is that people end up not realizing that their own subjective, that indiv mm -hmm. other people, actually probably better said that an individual's subjective preference for its specific pronunciation, for example, that subjective preference might be, I don't care that much about how Latin pr pronunciation might be, I'm comfortable with my accent, which is a German accent or an American accent or British mm. accent or French accent. I say, fine, 
great. I, mean, we, we, mm -hmm. I speak with Latin speakers every day with all kinds of great accents and it's fine. We all communicate. It's not a big deal. So mm -hmm. this is not something that I would ever, if I did, and I think I may have in the past said, we should do it this way. And now I don't really feel that way anymore because it's clearly not an obstacle. Right. Um, at least for Latin Greeks, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I just want to throw that out yeah, there. I mean, it's, that said, go ahead. Well, so what, I mean, it, it, I'm, I completely agree. You know, this um, conversation is not going to be about, you know, this, you should learn this pronunciation for this language or this other pronunciation. Of course, we do kind of sort of prescribe a pronunciation for um, ancient Greek, but it's really more of a just, here's an option for anyone who's interested. It's not it's a, a everybody should, Exactly. Um, we're not saying that everybody should pronounce Greek the way that that uh, that we want them to pronounce Greek. Yeah. It has nothing to do with that. Um, and what um, I really care about is not convincing people to pronounce things a certain way. What I care about is getting people to a point where they can pronounce things the way that they want to pronounce things, right? So everybody, I mean, maybe not everybody, but most people, when they learn a language, they have some aesthetic notion of of what they like about that language, what they would like to sound like. Um, you know, often when someone learns a language, especially if they really enjoy learning that language, like if it's not for a job or something, um, they enjoy the sound of that language. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to reproduce that. And so if that's a goal for you, if there's, it doesn't matter what pronunciation you are interested in uh, within that language, because there will be many different pronunciations usually, um, but, the ability to say, okay, this is a way of speaking that I would like to emulate, and I'm going to train myself in order to do that. Not, you know, the goal is not perfection necessarily. It's not like, you know, to be able to pretend to be a native speaker. Um, I mean, it can be, but it, it doesn't have to be. But uh, it can still just be an incredibly valuable thing to have in your toolkit is, is um, uh, phonetic awareness and phonological awareness. So, Mm. Um, I think the best way to understand this is in the context of language learning in general um, and the concept of um, comprehensible input, right? Which is basically um, the foundation of how languages are acquired is mm. you take in the language and you understand the majority of what you take in and that, you know, um, builds up your proficiency in that language. Um, and so this is why it's so important what you're doing, Luke, in creating all of this content. Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, there's a reason why, uh, <laughs> why you just hit 60,000 subs. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> well, no, I mean, well, thank you. I just wanted to, to add and emphasize again, that's so much of what I, I do and talk mm -hmm. about and have enjoyed being able to talk about is, uh, I knew stuff before we met, but you took mm -hmm. my understanding and knowledge of, uh, phonologies, um, mm -hmm so much higher than it was. And I wouldn't be able to talk, wouldn't be uh, in grado di, what is that in English, capable of? Um, no, I'm no, sorry, no. the bilingual podcast is in two days, everyone. Sorry, not this one. Not, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the Italian one, uh, the Italian English Davide. one. Con Davide. Um, uh, the uh, in grado di, is that capable of? It just feels right to say in grado di. Mm -hmm. I would not be in grado di, um, <laughs> speak about the things that I, I do now without mm. uh, your constant um Nagging. helpful <laughs> no uh the 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 advice that you've given over the years yeah mm. yeah so i interrupted you but uh, thank you for, for <laughs> saying but I, I feel like you're, you're the been a nice partner be, of it from uh, the beginning for a long long time well, yeah yeah it's always nice to be interrupted when uh, someone is stroking your ego so <laughs> 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 but um but uh you know you're creating all of this content, um, a lot of which is is specifically designed to, to be comprehensible input in Greek and in Latin. Um, and you really champion, champion this uh, method that uses other materials that have been developed to work in the same way, like lingua latina per se illustrata. Um, and so the sort of fundamental concept of, of what's going on there in terms of why this works so well for acquiring language is that you basically um, have content that is exactly at or slightly above rather the level that you're currently at. And so you're able to gain new information and also reinforce structures by taking in those messages and um, figuring, figuring out the handful of new things based on the context that you understand. Mm, examples um, of 
uh, of comprehensible input would be the Familia Romana book and the Lingua Latina per se illustrata series in general. Aleph with right. Beth, they teach uh, biblical Hebrew. Um, mm -hmm. The Your own uh, two series for, right, for Latin Lingua language. Latina comprensibilis and um, mm -hmm. uh, ancient Greek in action are mm -hmm. all example French in action, which is uh, mm -hmm. a huge source. And the, the destinos of uh, for Spanish are all these wonderful examples mm -hmm. of comprehensible inputs um, that I've actively used or been right. obviously working on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in many cases, though, so lingua latina per se illustrata is, is a sort of interesting example because it's so much content that for many a people, at least, um, is more or less perfectly set up so that you're always just getting, you know, messages that are barely above your, above your level. Although, um, of course, there are some maybe flaws with it, some people would say, in terms of too much new information in certain parts of, of the text. But, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's, you know, probably the most effective, large scale, comprehensible input project that uh, anyone has ever created for a specific language. Um, but in general, and even with something like lingua latina per se illustrata, there's a degree to which additional explicit knowledge will be useful and will make that input more comprehensible um, so that you can make more effective use of it. So if you really don't actually understand what's going on in the, in the input um, that you're taking in, then you're going to get less benefit from it. Um, and so it's important to not go overboard and exclusively teach the, you know, how everything works in a sort of mechanical way. That's, that's the sort of traditional grammar translation method of um, language learning that uh, I think, it, you know, the topic has sort of been beaten to death, but it's pretty clear is just not very effective um, and not very efficient. But a certain amount of explicit information can be incredibly valuable. And I think that's exactly what um, is the case with pronunciation. Because the vast majority of people um, learn pronunciation just through input, right? So they take an input, and to some degree, they manage to, to varying degrees, they manage to replicate what they're taking in. Um, some people, without any kind of explicit instruction in phonology, um, do an extremely good job of replicating um, the system that they're taking in. And other people have more difficulty with it. And so you end up with a range of results. This, this is um, more particularly in the context of uh, you know, someone learning a language that has native speakers when you can you know, very clearly judge in comparison um, with the language as it's natively spoken. Mm -hmm. And so people see this, learners see this range of results for different people, and they say, oh, well, you know, this is just a matter of innate ability. Some people have an ear for it, other people don't. That's just how it works, so it's not worth worrying about. And if it's really, you know, if, if you're really not interested in pronunciation, that's totally fine. Um, however, I think that um, it's, this is sort of a bit like if you said, well, you know, some people have an easier time memorizing vocabulary, which is true, and other people have a much harder time. So therefore, you shouldn't really worry about learning vocabulary too much because some people will learn a lot of words and some people won't learn very many words at all. And of course, you know, that's not the case. You need to learn words in order to, to learn the language. Mm. And so if you have more, like I often have, um, you know, a lot of difficulty memorizing words long term um, when I learn languages. So I use various tools to really reinforce that vocabulary so that I can keep it memorized uh, in the long term. Uh, like Anki, for instance, is a space repetition Anki. software. Anki. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like without Anki, it would be way harder for me to to learn vocabulary. I agree. And so, and, and, mm, pardon yeah. me, Raf. I just wanted to say, tell all of our um, people in the chat, if you have questions at all for Raf, like I said, I, in uh, to me, he is an expert in this stuff. And so you may have some questions about specific languages or topics that he's bringing up. Please ask, because we'd love to address your questions. And uh, you have some questions already, which we'll get to in a, in a moment here when we, we take a pause. Mm. Go ahead, Raf. Yeah. yeah um, so I think there's tools that are actually much more approachable than one might think, um, mm. which one can learn that make it so that you can listen to the, the target language and understand actually to a large degree, what's going on mechanically in terms of the sounds that you're taking in, both consciously have, and subconsciously. I have the IPA uh -huh. Vel chart ready if whenever you want to show it. 
<laughs> I, I have it up too as well. Oh, good. <laughs> we'll, yeah, you can share we'll, stuff we'll, as well. We'll, get to, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that, I guess. But uh, cool. right on. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll get to some specific examples um, so that this all becomes very clear. But once you understand how sounds work, or really when you understand some pretty basic concepts about how sounds work, um, and you get some practice with them, um, it just becomes so much easier to listen to the language that you're trying to learn and take it in and internalize the pronunciation system and then later output. And of course, the result is never going to be perfect from the beginning, but that's when in the same way as, as with you know the proper nuances of how you use certain words or um, various grammatical structures, um, you'll get it wrong a little bit at first and then you output and maybe you get correction. Um, you can use native feedback um, to gradually improve your pronunciation where you can sort of, if you understand exactly what you're doing with your mouth uh, and with your vocal tract, you can make these small adjustments intentionally until native speakers say, oh, wow, I, you know, I've never heard a foreigner pronounce this word that way. Um, you know, I've never heard a foreigner manage to pronounce this sound. Um, and, you know, once again, this will interest some people more than others. But um, yeah, it's really uh, an incredible tool that I think should be made more accessible to people. Mm. And that a lot more people than currently would be interested if they knew how accessible it was and if they had you know, good access to um, resources for it. Yeah. No. yeah, I can think of a couple of people with outstanding, who are not native English speakers, but have such uh, convincing Mm -hmm. um, shockingly good accents, like Davide Gemello, who I think is in the chat, and he said hi. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, ciao, he, Davide. He, he likes her glasses. Great glasses. So, <laughs> yeah, we're going to chat with him live in a couple days. That's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, who sounds so American, and to the mm -hmm. point where it, I find it uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or I do still, you know. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, and and I think he achieved that, and we'll probably talk about it too in a couple of days. But what you're talking about, he learned the IPA vowel chart, which I'm going to throw up just because I want to. There, you know, he learned uh, these kinds of things and was able to do that to add the uh, very very native like uh, nuance mm -hmm. to his speech by understanding mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Right. And uh, I think that's that's uh, exactly what you're talking about. It's readily doable if people just don't haven't had the tools. You know, the, the mm -hmm. typical pronunciation guides in whatever book, even for native English speakers, which is what we're used to saying, we're saying, oh, the vowel a, as in perque, is like the English word they. Right. But without the y, if they add that, which yeah. is great. But then it's like <laughs> right. But, but it's still it's often not very useful, and it doesn't it doesn't teach English speakers how to actually make that sound um, in a way that's useful, right? Because that, that information can be a good starting point. You can tell an English speaker, oh, you, 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 know, you have this sound sort of in this context, although it's linked to this yes yeah sound that you have to get rid of, but then you know, English speakers are like, well, how do I get rid of that? Um, it, it's the so, it's, yeah. it's amazing how little people know, and it's not their fault, they just haven't, I, mm -hmm. I've always been into it. Um, hmm. So I was already at this really, like, r very receptive level for the kind of stuff that you started um, guiding me on <laughs> a few years ago. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe maybe if hmm. you throw up the vowel chart, we can actually uh, I could pull again, the vowel chart. We could we could talk about um, this a little bit because this is a perfect example of something where people like look the shirt at this. with sound too, so people can hear it. Oh wait, I can't do that. <laughs> wait, where'd it go? Oh no, I have, I have to do it. In, I mean, in you you browser. can just uh, you can just do the sound for us, Luke. You can just pronounce all the all the vowels. No, but like hearing go, ka a ka sounds like a bird. Yeah, <laughs> I love that guy. Yeah, man, that must have taken like a year of his life to record all of those. All right, mm. tab with sound, share audio, and there. All right, mm. here we go. So, so uh, for example, oh, go ahead. You tell me where you want to go. Well, I mean, so I, I just wanted to say about this, this is a perfect example of something that people look at when they, like, let's say someone says, okay, I want to learn about Spanish phonology. So they like go onto the Spanish phonology Wikipedia page, which is a great resource. It will have a ton of useful information. Once It's also a great step because most people don't even do that. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> but a lot of people will do that maybe at, maybe at someone's recommendation. And they'll look at something like this and they'll be like, oh God, what is this? How do I, how do I even begin to make this make sense or make this be useful to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's actually just 
like three basic concepts that you need to understand. Ignoring, ignoring the specifics of what each symbol is, that doesn't really matter. That you can learn in the context of a language, just like how you would learn the alphabet of a language in the context of a language. Um, you can worry about the specific symbols for specific sounds in the context of the language that you're studying, maybe yeah. in comparison with your native language. But I don't like I never remember this one. Uh, which one? This one. What, what is this one? Oh, 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 I, I can't see your mouse. So I oh, you can't. Oh, uh, can you hear it? Uh, oh, this one. Oh, can yeah. Say highlighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, yeah no, I see. Sorry. For uh, just to give an example <laughs> of I love this stuff and I and but there are vowels on here that I don't use in the languages I work with normally right. and therefore I don't remember like that one. But so we know the ones that we need to do the languages we work exactly. with, Spanish, Italian, yeah. Latin, Greek, and so forth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really only three very basic concepts that you need to understand in order for this to like start being kind of useful for you. Um, so I guess we could just we could just teach a little bit of, of, uh, of beginner articulatory phonetics, um, which is that, um, so you make vowels with basically the position of your tongue in relation to the rest of your mouth, which makes different shapes that air then passes through, and that's how you get different vowel sounds, right? And so this diagram is actually in the shape of a mouth from the side, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the front of the mouth, you, and this is the back of the mouth? Exactly. Um, oh, so you, you, know, you have the, the roof of the mouth, the front of the mouth, which is near the, the teeth, and then you have the bottom jaw, basically, and then you have the, the back of the mouth slash throat. Um, and your tongue can sort of move around in two dimensions anywhere in this space. And so um, one way to go about feeling this um, is, uh, and sort of gaining awareness of what your tongue is doing in your mouth is just if we take some example sounds. So in English, we have the vowel E as in feet, and then we have the vowel a e. as in as in bat, or if you're not an English speaker, just an a. a like in Italian, ah, um, that works too. Right, this one. Um, ah, yeah, that, that, one, that one. And right. if you transition between those two sounds, if you say, e yeah, e yeah, you can actually feel that your jaw opens up so that your tongue can go lower and it's literally moving further away from the roof of your mouth, right? So when your tongue is close to the roof of your mouth, when it's high, then you have the sound e, and then e. when it's lowered, you have the sound ah, e, ah, e. Ah. and then, you know, you have different sounds in between those. So a, eh, for instance, is between those two, e, yeah, right? Um, e. So that's one, one axis. And then you have another axis going from front to back. So um, you have e, once again, it's not, on, not only is it high, not only is it close to the roof of your mouth, but it's also forward, it's, it's close to your teeth. And then if you say, ooh, like an Italian, e. ooh, or even an English, ooh, will, will work. Um, you can actually feel if you transition between those two sounds, e -u, e -u, like literally, if you're watching, try, try doing this. If, uh, if you aren't familiar with this stuff, e you'll literally feel your tongue. Yeah, <laughs> you'll literally feel your tongue moving forward and backward, right? So that's, that's, that's concept okay. number two which is that you mm. have this front back axis and you have this up down axis. Um, and then the final thing to understand for this to be useful is that your lips, generally speaking, will do one of two things. They will either be relaxed as in the vowel E or they will be e. rounded as in ooh. And you can see my lips be make this rounded shape ooh, right? Or O oh, is another rounded vowel. And with those three concepts, the fact that your tongue can be closer to the roof of your mouth or further away from the roof of your mouth, that is high or low, the fact that your tongue can be closer to your teeth or closer to the back of your throat, that is front or back, and the fact that your lips can be rounded or unrounded, that is relaxed, um, those are the only three variables for all of the vowels on this chart. Every single one of them is just some, is just your tongue is in a certain spot um, in regards to front, back, and up, down, and your lips are either rounded or unrounded. And some languages will do sort of other interesting things to make new vowel sounds. So like Latin, of course, has long and short vowels, um, which we can- yeah, These are just qualities on here. 
Yeah, right. These, aren't these are, but these are the vowel sound itself, the shape that your yeah. that your mouth makes in order to make the vowel. And uh, maybe that is like too much information to process right this moment. But I oh, promise, when you get into studying the phonology of the language with these basic concepts, with this phonetic awareness of what your tongue actually does to make different vowel sounds, you can start to gain an appreciation of the phonological system of your language of, okay, these are the, these are the vowel sounds that exist in this language. Your tongue is roughly in these different positions. Your lips do are either rounded or unrounded um, in order to make each of these vowel sounds. And that can be incredibly useful for when you're learning new vowel systems in a foreign language. Mm. So of course it takes practice um, and you have to go from the phonetic awareness, which is Phonetics is literally what your mouth is doing physically to the phonological awareness. Phonology is the system of sounds that exists in a language. Um, and once you start to build that awareness, then taking in the language, you will actually acquire that phonological system and be able to reproduce mm. it naturally and very consistently. Might um, be a little bit yeah. like um, when one starts to play the piano, Mm -hmm. um, you just like, oh, I got to do this thing with the keys and oh, sound comes out. But you might not mm -hmm. do it with, you might not understand how to read music yet. You're just kind of like going through it, going through motions as directed by a, a teacher. And then eventually the system, the phonological system and this metaphor, in which case mm -hmm. would be like a music theory, not necessarily, <laughs> a, you know, in some, in some way becomes more clear. Like, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's eight, you know, there's an octave because there's the seven basic notes and then diatonic scales mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm gonna take some right. questions and comments. Yeah, sure. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the top here. Um, it does indeed, good sir. I'll take this out for uh. a second. Oh, <laughs> and uh, yep, retracted S. We will talk about absolutely. And excellent. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, I like the the siren emojis. Yes. Yeah. This title uh, promises. It. Yes. Um, and we got some, <laughs> we got some votes for you Zoom and, and you no and me Zoom. Both. So, so um, let's see. Let's where um uh, do, 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 do people think I look good in glasses? Evidently, and I'm sure you as well. French in action, yes. Um, exactly, Christopher. Is it Laszlo? Laszlo, I think. Right, Laszlo. Laszlo, I think. Um, anyway, um. Yes, French in action. I did a video about it here on Polymathy. You can check it out. I do a little description there where you can find the link in the description of that video and I'll give you everything you need. Uh, let's see. Another great, uh, another great comprehensible input resource for French is, uh, what is it called? Le Français. Uh, oh, yeah, the, um, the, yeah, the, uh, Français. The, the nature method. I don't speak French, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce the title correctly. But... In the French in action video in the description. Mm. If not, someone oh, put really? a comment there and okay. then I'll. Yeah. Good. Was, you can get a free PDF go. online. Exactly. It's like, the... it's like Lingua Latina. It's like that series. It's yeah. Very good. And Ion Academy, or Ion, 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 Ion. Ion, Ion Academy. Ion Academy mm -hmm. is, is doing it, uh, the whole thing. They just put up another video today, actually. Um, mm -hmm. do, 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 uh, looking for. Uh, ah. Do you translate? Do I translate uh, Latin text? I try to avoid translating Latin text. I have actually translated one, uh, well, it's not an ancient text. I translated one poem by, uh, by uh, my personal favorite Latin uh, poet, Alexius Cosanus. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, if you, I have a YouTube channel, um, I was about Video to say polymathy. I'm I'm not I'm not polymathy. <laughs> I don't have I don't have a I don't have polymathy. Yes, uh, paleoglass. Um, I have a recording of um, of a poem by uh, Alessio. It's a beautiful poem. I tried to recite it uh, beautifully, as beautifully as I could, uh, yeah. and I, I put a little translation. But uh, but no, I, I enjoy reciting I'd, his poems. I haven't done it in a couple of years publicly, but I I, yeah, I mm. love his, his poetry sounds. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, Pteris asking about the pronunciation of L in, uh, in Latin and the velarization mm. of it. I'll, I can frame it a little bit with Sidney Allen, who is 
also responsible mm. with Stewartville uh, for a lot of this stuff that we deal with today. Mm. Wonderful philologists. So when I critique them, mm -hmm. it's just because I've read some other stuff that's a little bit more more recent. And um, so the, the notion that Latin has more than one L sound is derived in part from more re somewhat more recent 20th century stuff like Sidney Allen's Vox Latina, which is a great book, an excellent book. Mm -hmm. um, and also based on the fact that ancient Romans speak about there being two different L sounds. The problem or sometimes three. is, sometimes three. or sometimes <laughs> three. Um, the problem is not that there might not have been different phonetic realizations, because there doesn't seem to be a phonemic difference. It seems, mm -hmm. and the difference, between, okay, Brad, if you explain phonemic versus phonetic. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is another, another concept that, you know, it sounds like, it potentially sounds like kind of uh, arcane terminology, but uh, it's really quite simple. Um, a phone, um, which is, that's the, the basic base, basis of uh, phonetic, right? A phone is just a sound. It's like literally a thing you do with your mouth to make a sound. So, ah, that's a phone, right? Um, and a phoneme is a sort of abstract concept of a sound that contrasts with other sounds in the system of a language, in the phonological system of a language. So for instance, um, in English, we have this vowel, ah. Um, and in some dialects of English, it's only ever pronounced with one phone, with one realization. Um, and uh, so it's, it's that sound that I just made, ah. So someone might say man and cat and bat pretty much the same way. Um, maybe, you know, if you look at it with a spectrogram, you can, you know, find some minute differences, but, but for the most part, it's natively, exactly the same. Do you? you don't do those the same natively, do you? No, I don't. So I don't for, either. um, American, for most, uh, American English speakers, the a vowel is actually slightly diphthongized, meaning, um, it's sort of, a it, it shifts a bit from one mouth position to another, um, when it's before sounds like N or M. So for instance, I say cat with just a, ah, but then I say man, man. So don't say man, um, which would be the, the, a more sort of standard UK David pronunciation, Bowie. right? Um, <laughs> I say man, eh, eh, um, right. as opposed to a, ah, but just in that context. So I don't say cat. That sounds like a different accent from mine. Mm. But so cat, those man. don't contrast with each other, right? There, I can't have one word that's pronounced man and another word that's pronounced man, right? Those are, even if I pronounce it slightly differently, it would still sound like the same word to my ears. And the reason for that is that a ah and a, ah, although they're different phones, they're different actual um, sounds that you're making with your mouth slightly, they're allophones of the same phoneme. So basically, um, in your brain, in your sort of mental concept of the language, in your mental grammar, um, because phonology is actually, it's part of the grammar of the language, just like, yeah. uh, just like syntax, just like morphology, you know, conjugations, word order, that kind of thing. That's all grammar too, but phonology is, is also part of the grammar that you have in your brain of, of a language. Um, and so in that sort of mental grammar, um, you have different allophones of phonemes that will appear in, in certain contexts. Um, right. And so basically the, the argument that, um, that Sidney Allen is making uh, is that there was an allophonic distribution of, that is allophones appearing in, in certain contexts in a, in a systematic way. Um, in Latin, that was exactly the same as his allophonic distribution in English of the L sound. Specifically RP. Specifically RP, which is, you know, the most sort of standard upper class UK right. English variety. So two um, L's in, in RP would be, like not in my, and then when I say light as a uh, Northeastern United States speaker of English, <laughs> it's it's light and it's slightly velarized. Whereas oh, yeah. when I, if it's RP, it's, it's a light, light. And it's mm, more light. like the sound of Italian. That's the, called the bright L sometimes, mm -hmm. right? as opposed to uh, full, which mm -hmm. is quite a bit more velarized than when I say full. full. Though it's mm -hmm. not quite a bit, but slightly more velarized than full instead yeah. of full. It can depend on the speaker, the degree of, of velarization, Absolutely. which is basically, you know, whether, so when you make an L sound, the tip of your tongue is, is touching 
your front of your mouth, l or ol. And then the back of your tongue is either raised, if it's velarized, ol, or it's relaxed, l, if, uh, if it's right. like um, in Italian, like leggere. Um, right. And um, so in Latin, at mm. various points, it does seem to be the case that there were different distributions of allophonic realizations of L that can account for certain observable phenomenon, ph phenomena, or even potentially the ab observations of, of some of these grammarians. Although it must be kept in mind that, you know, when one Roman says there's two allophones and when another says there's three, and they don't even actually have the concept of an allophone yet, uh, you right. know, and other people never mention it, you know, yeah. um, it's really hard to interpret. Um, and because you'll have grammarians right. at different periods Right. describing um, a thin or a xilis L sound mm -hmm. as well as a pinguis right. or a uh, sound. Now, exactly. uh, Alan decided to make to conclude, which it's not linguistically insane. It's it's reasonable as a mm -hmm. hypothesis that the that the pinguis or the thick L sound was was velar, but that's oh, a subjective yeah. description which doesn't mm -hmm. really tell you much linguistically about what's going on. Right. Um, and, and he links it to he links it to two things. He links it to later developments in some of the Romance languages. Um, some, and he links it to earlier developments in sort of pre-classical Latin with some vowel shifts. The problem yeah. with this is that this is precisely the kind of thing, the realization of L, that can um, change um, in either direction uh, quite quickly in you know of, in very specific speech varieties, resulting in all sorts of fun developments. So we're going on a little bit of a tangent here, but, uh, but, but it's always fun to talk about hi historical. No, this is, I think this is exactly but, the, uh, this is right on the, the well, uh, yeah, subject. True, I think it's, yeah. And but really what I meant is I was about to go on a, on a bit of a tangent, if that's okay, like giving oh. an example of uh, yeah. in romance. Um, sure. So cool, cool. in, well, yeah. So, in, so in Spanish, uh, well, you know, if you ask someone, what's the word for tall in Spanish, they'll say alto, right? With this light L sound, just like in Italian, alto. Um, but it turns out that that was actually a learned borrowing from Latin. And in mm. old Spanish, so, you know, 600, 500 or more years ago, people said otto, not, not alto. And the reason why they said otto is because altus in Latin, um, which at some point would have become alto, just like in Italian, um, it was either, depending on which hypothesis you accept, already velarized, alto, or it became velarized, and so it was alto. And this velarized L sound, ol, often in many languages becomes a w sound. So actually, um, a very good example of this that many of our uh, listeners may be familiar with this is uh, is Brazilian Polish? Portuguese. Oh, excuse me, Polish. Oh, well, uh, Polish You're also, right. actually, yes. Brazil. Polish is another great, Brazil. Yeah, like Wukash. Or Hafael, my my own name. Uh, oh, Hafael. Hafael. That's that's yeah. great. It's great. But it's I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you know you have a shift from uh, alto to auto, and then au often simplifies to just o. It's a very common sound shift, and so you get old Spanish auto. Um, or another hilarious thing that happens in uh, one of my personal favorite Romance languages. Um, Totally not because I'm biased or anything. Catalan, Sardinian is uh, is in Sicilian. Darn it! So so this is a good example of of um, you know Sicilian and Italian are very closely related varieties. Italian has no signs of velarization whatsoever, right? You just have alto. Um, Sicilian, on the other hand, in many dialects because it, it varies depending on dialect as well, you have uh, the the same word is pronounced avuto. <laughs> and so the question is, what what happened there? How do you have alto in Italian and avuto in Sicilian? What happened is you have altus or altus, depending, and then it either was inherited as velarized or it became velarized alt, altu, and then it became wa, so autu, and then the wa became a va, so av avtu or avtu, maybe it was bilabial at first, avtu, av, av, avtu, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then that was hard to say, so they stuck an additional u in there between the v and the t, so you get avtu. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, <laughs> that's the Sicilian mm -hmm. equivalent. I wonder if Sicilian yeah. does that with uh, Greek words that have been borrowed, which would be like, mm -hmm. I don't know, aftos mm -hmm. or whatever, if they added mm -hmm. that little syllable. If it did, I think it would be very interesting. That would interesting. be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Be interesting. I have no idea. That's cool. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so the uh, my... Um, I think the 
uh, I think what's being described by the Roman grammarians is not velarization. And it's mm. because not only are they inconsistent, but they the, they say the exact opposite of what Sidney Allen prescribes. Some, one of them, I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, but I took a note of it so I can uh, find it later. If you write it in the comments later after this post, and I'll go find <laughs> it for you, and I'll post it in the description later on. Um, who specifically says that the, like in the word well, which is a way to say or, V-E-L, well, um, mm. well, I, and also il, and bellus, or whatever, he says that specifically the exilis, the thin version, mm. and then he describes uh, pinguis as the other one. It's like the exact opposite in terminology. Mm. And uh, and or something something close enough uh, to that where it completely throws into doubt the whole the idea that this this they have any idea what they're using in the terminology wise, mm -hmm. um, and uh, really the uh, so the, what what is pinguis or exilis what's thin or or thick as far as these sounds go is 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 a, just a subjective term. It's like saying that Russian or German are harsh languages. It's probably just because we've heard. This is usually the reason I think people consider those two languages harsh sounding is we've heard them in the context of James Bond movies or World War II movies, <laughs> where right. we have some kind of uh, aggressive military type person who is using the language in a way that sounds aggressive. So we interpret those languages as being aggressive. Well, and just stereotypes uh, cloud people's per perception as well. Yeah. I mean, as in, I know that my perception of Russian changed a lot once I actually studied it a little bit and had uh, Good for you know, Russian speaking. Yes. There's a VLRL. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my, what, what you uh, good on uh, when we spoke, actually when we spoke with Dr. Calabrese a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, we we asked him about about this, and I think he already had a good answer anyway, right, Raf? Which is that Italian already has a very thick sound by its palatalization of a geminated L sound, like bello. Bello. It's not bello. It's not bello. It's not the. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly bello. there's certainly variation in in uh, how the Italian L is pronounced in different contexts. Although it's never fully velarized, but you know, there's definitely variation between more palatal um, and more velar in different uh, in different contexts. But I'm just I'm not confident that the Romance evidence really says much about the distribution of different allophonic realizations of, of L in, in Latin in general. Standard Italian, Northern mm -hmm. Italian through Eastern Romance doesn't mm -hmm. show any velarization. So mm -hmm. that gives that gives me the idea that I would say if you want to use what Sidney Allen is prescribing, I'd say, okay, mm -hmm. that's a reasonable explanation. Mm -hmm. if, I think it could even be the voice of some ancient Romans in the classical period, even with the Velar L, but there's right. no way it could possibly uh, be descriptive of everyone or the standard right. Roman city urban pronunciation simply based on the way the language is spoken there that evolved from it. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? We have lots, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Davide was confirming something that you clarified a moment later about the oo. Because um, oh. English oo is usually diphthongized for most speakers. Not Scottish accent, right? It's just oo, mm. I think, right? You were there. You lived there long enough. Could you confirm that? Am I right? Scottish uh, pronunciation of English? Yeah, yeah. So, or maybe uh, min. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, min. Craig. Hey, Craig. Yeah. Thanks for being a member, my friend. Um, yeah, absolutely. That is... That is helpful. Stefanso Natido, we practice in singing. Yeah. Helpful. Um, actually, this is a very interesting uh, question. This is this is maybe a good example of how um, certain kinds of training can give you a sort of subconscious awareness later on. Because I've actually noticed myself that um, often people with musical training of some kind, um, not necessarily just people with training as kids, but just people. Um, who are very Sang interested in music or or, like or did music yeah. um, at various points in their lives, um, because they've sort of trained themselves to listen to things <laughs> in just sort of a very general way, they end up actually having an easier time acquiring new sounds and new phonologies. Um, and so, but once again, this is not the kind of thing where you should say, oh, well, I, I was never into music. I never studied music. So this is beyond me. Not true. Even even if you know this is something that you find um, challenging, um, if you just apply yourself, if you're interested and you apply yourself, you learn the basic information, and then you just learn the language, listen to the language, practice a little bit, get some feedback. Your pronunciation will improve, and it's also you know it's you can put as much or as little effort into it as you want, right? It's not an all or nothing thing. It's not like either you sound exactly like 
you know, the typical accent from your native language, or you sound perfectly like a native. And if you can't sound perfectly like a native, then there's no point in studying pronunciation. No, it's it's not like that I at all. I don't sound like a native anymore. <laughs> <laughs> man who the, knows too much. You know, the, sli <laughs> the slightest bit of, of awareness and of um, studying a phonology will have, um, will help you with, with learning the pronunciation of the language that you're targeting. Mm. So yeah. yeah, thanks Craig, thanks for being a member. Um, and Logan asks, are teachers common who teach phonetics explicitly when teaching some language? Learning German mm -hmm. in college was basically all up to me. Yeah, so this, I think, is one of my biggest complaints about um, sort of the modern institutions of language teaching is that um, often they ignore this element of the languages that they're teaching, even if their methods have become much, much better in a lot of other areas. Um, they ignore pronunciation when I think it can actually be a really valuable thing for someone that's just starting out at a language. Because the other, the other benefit um, to phonetic awareness is not just how you sound, but also your ability to understand what you're hearing. So there's all sorts of um, fascinating and you know, somewhat complicated but, but totally learnable processes that go on in my own native American English where certain sounds sound very different depending on the context, depending on the, the, the phonological context, what sounds they're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. And someone who doesn't understand those rules might end up having a more difficult time understanding me when I'm speaking in the way that I speak natively, like when I'm talking to you, Luke. And so if I notice as a, as a native speaker, if I notice that someone um, is having difficulty understanding me, I'll change the way that I speak to try to make it more understandable for them. But then if they're trying to watch a movie or a series or listen to two other people having a conversation, mm -hmm. it'll be difficult. And so this kind of um, building of awareness will allow you to understand what's going on and what you're hearing. And it will allow you to train yourself to um, correctly interpret the sounds that you're hearing as instead of just a stream of sounds as actual words. So um, this is why I think it really even for people who aren't super interested in, in pronunciation, if they're studying a language, especially in a, in a sort of organized program, like at a university, I really feel like um, more uh, time should be spent on going into how the pronunciation of the language actually works. It's and in um, a systematic way that the IPA mm -hmm. always did. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so, uh, well, just, just to, to finish in terms of... Um, whether people are doing, so people are doing this increasingly and it's sort of language specific. So for instance, with Japanese recently, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Japanese learner still, I would say, I mean, I can, you know, I can speak. I but, uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, no. uh, uh, um, so Japanese has um, something called pitch accent, which actually, mm. coincidentally, works probably extremely similar to how the accent worked in, in ancient Greek, the pitch accent of ancient Greek. And so studying a bit of Japanese pitch accent can also be useful for someone looking to um, emulate ancient Greek pitch accent when they're speaking Greek. But pitch accent is a part of Japanese learning and teaching. Um, that for the most part has been ignored and people have said the same kinds of things. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, you'll, you'll just either acquire it naturally or you won't. Um, people will understand you either way, et cetera, et cetera. There's no point in spending time on it. And Hand me that bridge so I can eat my <laughs> sushi. <laughs> right. And so many, many members of the community have sort of changed their minds about this. And there are teachers who are really doing a great job of pronounce of sorry, of uh, teaching it. So for instance, um, there's a YouTuber who's famous for doing, he's American, Do but he Dogen. does comedy in Japanese, Dogen. And um, he he's teaches- He's insane. Yeah, he's I mean, he's so incredible. Good. He's, he has, a, has an incredible native-like pronunciation. And, Blows my mind um, every time I see his videos. And uh, if you subscribe to his Patreon, he has a course teaching uh, Japanese pronunciation mm. and pitch accent. Both, actually, I don't know. All, all the fun and gritty details with great, uh, mm. great examples and and uh, visuals. And so that's like a perfect you. example of of someone who's filling this space now. 
Um, and like, I mean, you know, similarly, YouTube. that's that's sort of a oh, niche that I'm uh, hoping to fill a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Ap apropos, if you would like of... to get uh, trained by Raphael, then the link is in the description, or you can uh, sign up for his lessons. Right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, and if you uh, does that continue, if you have, uh, this is a question um, uh, of Ein and Aleph. Uh, those are Aleph. consonant sounds. Uh, those Lord are consonants, back, yeah. Right. And we will we'll look at a consonant. We... There's, we can, well, uh, it's, there's some, we'd have to pick, we take a language. But we have actually mm -hmm. have quite a number of other uh, interesting questions, I think. So let's uh, mm -hmm. let me go and take a look at this. They, only, they came from, oh, gosh, a half hour ago. Uh, well, this is a good one. Thank you. Uh, oh, is this, uh, hey, hey, Fabricio. What is the best way to learn all the vowels mm -hmm. from your desired language? Right. So I think um, it really, so there's stages, right? Um, in the same way that there's stages in terms of learning the language itself and acquiring the language itself, I think you want to start with learning a bit about just how vowels work and practicing it a, a little bit. Um, but that's basically just the information that I that I uh, <laughs> already explained. There's additional information that could be explained depending on the on the language, um, or or even in general. But uh, but for the most part, it's just that basic stuff learning that, that phonetic awareness initially, and then um, studying a bit about just the explicit information of, okay, this is the number of vowels in the language. So like, for instance, when I was learning Italian uh, at the beginning, um, everybody told me there were five vowels because there's five right. vowel letters, but there's seven. There are seven vowels, <laughs> right? There's I, E, E, A, O, O, U, right? Seven vowels in Italian. And it wasn't until a friend of mine pointed out to me you're pronouncing this word wrong because you're using the wrong a sound instead of a. It's supposed to be a. Dame so una pesca. <laughs> <laughs> um, until someone pointed out to me, I had no idea that this was the case, and I was just completely ignoring it. But once I learned that that was the case, and I practiced differentiating those sounds, I was able to listen to Italian and acquire the difference. I think Portuguese also has has the same difference between a and a. It does. Um, and um, so, so that's sort of the third step, right? Is first, you've learned a bit about how vowels work. Then you've learned a bit about the actual system that you're trying to learn, how many vowels there are, approximately where in the mouth they're produced. You practice producing them the, yourself. At first, you won't be able to 100% of the time consistently pronounce them, produce them correctly, but um, you know, with practice, you'll improve. And then you listen to a ton of the language. You listen out for those distinctions. Um, you can even listen to audios of, of signal check. Raf is frozen on my side. Could someone uh, in a comment, let me know if uh, Sam or me. Oh, hey, hey Raf. I don't know if I was freezing or, or if you were. Hello. I'm did, checking. Uh, did everyone hear what I was saying, or did I? Uh, you, you cut out just a, a moment uh, ago, about 30 seconds ago. Um, but I'm asking. Oh. It was, uh, yeah, apparently you were frozen, uh, according frozen. to comments. But uh, yeah, go ahead and, and say what you were, you were saying again. Uh, from, from where? Uh, OK. Hi, so, I, so... Uh, this is Raf, and uh, he's going <laughs> to talk to us today about pedology. We're going to do the whole, the whole hour long podcast again. <laughs> yeah, so. Um... <laughs> So in the context of Italian, you heard that part, right? Um, yeah, the, about the, I learned, um, right. And I said, sto mangiando una pesca. That was, I think, right. right where we cut out. Um, I listened to a bunch of Italian. I said, I said that. Yes. I listened to a bunch of Italian, now knowing the difference between these, these things. Mm -hmm. um, and that allowed me to acquire it. And so basically, by going in these steps, first you, you practice, um, first you learn about how sounds work. Then you practice the specific system you read about and understand and listen to and, and practice the specific system that you're learning. And then you just listen to the language, you listen to words in the language that make these distinctions that you're trying to acquire, um, both consciously and subconsciously, try to pay attention to these sounds, but also just get tons of input as you're learning the language in general. And then when you're outputting, when you're speaking, um, solicit feedback, ask native speakers, hey, am I distinguishing these sounds correctly? Do you notice anything that's off? Um, Mm. Often they will not be able to give you detailed information in the way that a phonologist no. can, or they won't be able to say, you know, this vowel is too closed or this vowel is too open. But they what they will be able to say right. is this yeah. sounds off or this sounds correct. 
And based on that input, you can make adjustments. So if an Italian says the, the way you're pronouncing, mm -hmm. so, well, oh, just that, you know, uh, that, that people have different accents that if you're going for a certain accent, the person mm -hmm. you're speaking to might not have the accent they are seeking to acquire. Right. Right, right. Like if you're studying standard so, Italian and you ask some, uh, uh, maybe someone from uh, Torino who might mm -hmm. have, a, who might not have the same kind of um, vowel distinction we were just talking about uh, for right. a certain word, and <laughs> so I, I guess basically, they're they're in, the native speakers are very important, but mm -hmm. you might find different native speakers later telling you different things. Exactly. exactly. So you know, be aware of what be aware of what uh, accent you're trying to learn and the accent of the person that you're talking to. You know, if you're trying to learn Brazilian Portuguese, maybe don't get too much feedback from a European Portuguese speaker or vice versa, um, right. etc. But al but also, there's stuff in general that that will be the same across the whole language. So, for instance, most um, most of course it varies from accent to accent, but most English speakers can tell you if you're pronouncing the difference between e eh and a. Ah correctly. So many people who learn English have a problem disting distinguishing words like bet from bat. And those are two completely different words for me. And yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. to many non-native speaking people who aren't really aware of, of the fact that the vowel in bat is more open mm -hmm. um, and the vowel in bet is slightly, the tongue is slightly closer to the roof of the mouth. Um, people who aren't, who don't have that awareness will just have a lot of difficulty. As in one time I had someone tell me, no, you're not pronouncing this differently. Those are the same thing. I don't believe you. <laughs> and um, and so by building that awareness and listening to native speakers so and soliciting that. feedback, you can say, you know, hey, am I, am I pronouncing the word bet as in B-E-T sufficiently differently from bat as in B-A-T? And a native speaker will, will be able to tell you at the very least either yes or no. You don't necessarily want any anything other than a yes or no from them because then they might tell you something that's totally wrong. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, mm -hmm. that's that. Those are the steps. Um, explicit knowledge um, at a general level. Explicit knowledge targeted towards your native language. Input, output, and feedback, and then more input. That. I'm going to add timestamps to this. I'm going to make a note. Mm -hmm. to have a timestamp at about fifty-five for that question. Wait, this is on. Mm. Uh, wait, what is the question? <laughs> so it's uh, the uh, learning your language's vowel system, right? Okay. Oh, hey, it's, uh, it's a quill quill. Yes. I know. Wait, I'm we're probably like a half hour behind on these questions. Oh, wait, oh, uh, quill, quill, quill? Who's that? Uh, that's, that's, that's my Italian friend Giovanni, who is literally the one who told me uh, eight years ago or something, hey, you're not distinguishing A and S. So <laughs> ah, <funny>. grazie, Giovanni. <laughs> Because you set him on this path to be uh, my my uh, valued colleague and, and friend, so uh, I just I just wanted to compliment uh, compliment uh, Piotr for this hmm. David Bowie reference, which means there's two so far. Thank you for the the David Bowie <laughs> reference. I I approve. So we've got two of them in. All right, let's see hmm. your other comments, uh, folks. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, there was one up here. Yeah. I almost pushed. the the Piotr actually said it comment just briefly about um, palatal sounds, which is yes. another great example of, of, you know, the difference between, um, you know, palatal T and non-palatal T, uh, yeah. like, what's the word, like in the word, uh, like children in, in Russian. Perfect. Um, at first, uh, you know, when I started learning, I can't speak Russian, but, uh, but I studied it for a little bit. And um, at first, I could not pronounce these sounds correctly. I just could not. And so... I looked up what is my tongue supposed to do when I make these sounds. I practiced it. I went to my, you know, the native speakers that I knew and I sent them recordings and I said, how's this? And they were like, no. And then sometimes they were like, oh yeah, that one's good. And then I wouldn't be able to replicate it. And then over time I practiced and I mean, I don't know, maybe a Russian in the comment will now say, no, you're totally saying get you wrong. But, uh, <laughs> but I think at, at least back when I was actually studying, I, I, I got it uh, more or less correct. So. Mm. Um, yeah, any sound, no matter how difficult it seems at first, if you practice it in this way that I'm that I'm prescribing, um, it is learnable. No matter what level of innate talent you believe that you have, you know, just like vocabulary, yeah. just exactly. like grammar, and grammar. And, like, and, yeah, mm -hmm. there's nothing. 
Uh, I think people are actually, when you were uh, talking about the uh, the example um, a few minutes ago, I was thinking about how people, I think, are particularly self-conscious. Not only, uh, um, people are, tend to be self-conscious about language because we have to speak mm. uh, in order to do the, the thing. So inherently, I think we get, even in our own languages, our native languages, someone might criticize the way we pronounce something. Um, mm. I know that that can happen. We don't, I think we encounter that nearly as much in English, but I think it's pretty common in uh, mm. French and Italian language for native speakers to receive that kind of feedback of like, oh mm. no, it's it's not Bosco, it's Bosco or, or whatever, whichever one it is. <laughs> Actually, I, mean, I don't agree with the standard pronunciation. Of, uh, anyway, I don't think it's etymologically wrong, but um, whatever, La Crusca. Maybe, maybe we should address this mm. uh, question. Um, can you comment on the use of cultivating good pronunciation in ancient languages specifically? That's where you get lots of people saying it's totally negligible. Absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> Did I miss that one? Um, or was I come, where are we coming up on that? One? It's a, it's a bit later, but um, okay. I'm still at five but, minutes, five hours, seven or five, at five seven p.m. local time. Apologies to, to all the questions, but uh, no, this is great. We're, we're seems get particular, most particularly, uh, I like yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. So, um, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I, I think we, we really should actually talk about this because yeah. you say spend the question so much again because I, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So the question was, uh, can you comment on the use of cultivating good pronunciation in ancient languages specifically? That's where you get lots of people saying it's totally negligible, right? Um, which is true. Um, and there are different benefits. Um, I would say there are different reasons. Um, to learn to really study phonology of an ancient language than there are for modern languages. Um, but there are still very good reasons, I think, if it's something that you're into. So one is just if you're interested in the language on an aesthetic level, like I am. I mean, I think most people, if you told them, you know, like, here's how this ancient language sounds. If you can press this button, you can be able to pronounce it exactly like that. Most people would press the button, right, to like have that skill. <laughs> And it's, of course, it's, you know, in real life, it's it's not a button, it's a bit more, you know, a bit more effort than that, but it's not that much more effort than that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you just have to apply yourself to it. And so there, there's, there's you know, the aesthetic argument, and that's, you know, everybody has their preferred pronunciation, everybody listens to the language, even in ancient language, um, because, of course, we believe that ancient languages should be spoken actively in order to promote actual fluency in the language, even if your goal is just to read. But so, you know, anyone will have a preference for how they would like to hear the language being spoken. And so I feel like they should have the tools to be able to pronounce it the way that they also like to hear it. Um, and so in addition to that, however, there's the fact that actually in many cases, the, the things that we are accessing, the literature in particular of ancient languages that we are accessing, um, Pronunciation is often a very important part of that. So any kind of metrical text in Latin or Greek or Sanskrit or Arabic or Persian, um, the um, rhythm, which is really basically the length of consonants and vowels, because all of those languages, well, I don't, I don't know about consonant length. Um, many of those languages distinguish long and all short them. consonants. Yeah, and all the, of them distinguish long and short vowels. Well, Persian, I mean, Sanskrit, I, Arabic, yeah, absolutely. The, per, Persian is long and short consonants also. Oh, I mean, I don't sure. know. Persian speaker. It wouldn't know. surprise me. Yeah, so if anyone speaks Persian, let us know. But uh, but vowels definitely. Classical Persian, like ancient Persian, or not or old right. Persian. I mean. Right, right, right. One of those. Um, and there's all of this wonderful poetry. And I am, I just want to go on record and say, I am not saying that you cannot enjoy metrical texts without worrying about pronunciation. I'm not saying that whatsoever. What I'm saying I is it's... Because <laughs> then you're just getting information. I mean, it's, it's somewhat translated. Mm -hmm. The same mm -hmm. reason that we... Don't mm -hmm. I think that's that's sort of uh, the the that's the strongest impetus I could give. I think the most beautiful poetry ever written was by um, ancient Romans and those who have imitated their style in Latin um, even more than Greek. I love the Greek poetry, but I think they're a little bit cooler. And so for <laughs> this specific reason, um, mm -hmm. it's just not. Um, if something is translated about it, poetry is untranslatable uh, because to unlike prose, where you can get facts out mm -hmm. and and because those of us who as, who aspire to speak an ancient language like Latin uh, and to read it with fluency, we know that we're doing that because we want the language to be part of who we are, just as it could be to study French, to read Moliere, to study uh, and speak Italian in order to appreciate Dante mm -hmm. through Italo mm -hmm. Calvino. Um, 
we we know that if we just are working in translation, we're missing something. But that's just prose. Mm -hmm. If we're not doing, or uh, not all of it was prose, some of it was poetry I mentioned, but if it's poetry, then there's some other somewhat musical element, which is therefore not, right. uh, which is not in it. And if we are subtracting the musical element, it's like, I mean, there's a lot of, there's lyrics to a lot of good songs, mm -hmm. but without, if you remove the melody, it's, mm -hmm. of, it's, it's uh, <laughs> not the same thing. And, it, and the intent of the author is not, um, is not received. Right. So I would, I would, I'm a little but bit, yeah. Teeny weeny a bit harder than yeah, you can enjoy it some. There's an element in translation. But there are elements of it that you will enjoy, and and um, I mean, I think this is in particular true with with. Um, so in the case of Latin, what often ends up happening is people put a lot of effort into. They feel like the meter is an additional thing that they have to learn on top of the poetry, and they have to like learn how to do the meter in order to read the poetry, and. There are a handful of instances where that's actually kind of true in that there are some instances where there are, you know, little metrical tricks that are actually different from how the language would be naturally spoken. But for the most part, if you just apply, well, I'm talking about like, you know, in Katulus 5, I think there's Deinde, which is pronounced with, uh, with a diphthong. Dein. That's the normal pronunciation, yeah. Is it, oh, is it one syllable normally? Well, that, well that's the thing, because that, the, yeah, we oh. see that even in, in uh, Cicero and stuff that, that mm. that's not metrical. No, and I remember you taking the okay. the Catullus course too, where they probably taught that. Oh, yeah, it's it's a diphthong here for the meter, and right. no, the poetry is oh. basically a guidebook to natural pronunciation. And that's interesting, and and we can definitely have I mean, discussions I guess that, about that. Makes details. sense that people would have said uh, would have said ding because it's that's just normal, easy to say. But, it's, yeah. They say the same thing about mult mult in the first mult uh, few lines of Virgil that mult ille because they because that's it's an, a complete. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's not confirmation bias, but it's one of those kinds of fallacies where they think, oh, multumile is the normal pronunciation because that's how they were taught for all those mm -hmm. years. And then they get the multuile and they're like, what is this? Oh, that's right. a, they, you allied through M's in poetry. And right. they, oh, that's a poetical feature, not realizing that's a natural part of the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, but still, usually in, in Latin, two vowels next to each other, unless they're a pair of uh, or sorry, two vowel letters next to each other, unless they they would normally indicate a diphthong. Generally, they indicate two syllables. No, like normally. It depends on the word. I mean, it depends um, on the word. It's it's there. Yeah, the e, e put together could it be diphthong or it could be um, it two, could be two, two syllables. syllables. Right. Uh, but sorry. And, so the yeah. mm -hmm. the point the point that I was making is that is is the point that you are you know making excellently, which is that. Um, when you know how the pronunciation, the ancient pronunciation as we've reconstructed it works, you can just read any metrical text in that pronunciation and it's in the meter just automatically right. because it was literally written in the meter. And so if you pronounce it the way they pronounced it, you don't have to change anything about how you read it in order to, to read it in meter. It's exactly like how maybe you have to have a little bit of awareness of how iambic pentameter, for instance, works in Shakespeare's poetry. But for the most part, if you as a native English speaker just stress words as you naturally stress them, then the lines are written in that meter. And so when you're reading the poem, you know, da 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 that's the rhythm of, yeah. of, of Shakespeare. It just comes argue. through. And that's the yeah. argument that David Crystal makes in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in his, his work, uh, which is that, um, if you, if we pay attention to what the poetry is telling us, mm -hmm. it reveals the natural pronunciation of that time. Like reason and raisin were pronounced the same way, you have, mm -hmm. uh, or um, or any other number of wonderful little things that we can tell because of rhymes and other mm -hmm. aspects. Um, right. so, and w the person who, in because the idea that language changes as much as it does has not mm -hmm. been as clearly understood, I think, until more recently. Right. And then I think in general, still today. People mm -hmm. don't really have an intuitive sense that languages change. They're aware of different dialects and accents within their own language, but not that this is truly something that's changed over time because people aren't necessarily that even willing to accept that Shakespeare's pronunciation was so radically different mm -hmm. from the way RP or even American English sound. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but this is it. This is so just like David Crystal demonstrates with Shakespeare's poetry. Ah, this is the key to how the language is spoken. This is not some sort of poetical thing. Mm -hmm. Just the same with Catullus and all these other things, Multuile and Virgil. That these right. are the, the. This is just how the language is pronounced. Right. And I, I want to sing your your praise on one other thing. 
um, because I was I was uh, with you and I barely gave you an assistance at all while you were studying Latin on your own Familia Romana. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited, it was just a couple of years ago, uh, too, I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it, three years ago? It was a little while, while ago. Three, but, three um, years ago, yeah. Three years ago. Um, you were going through Familia Romana on, on your own. I was so excited for you to get to chapter 34, which is the penultimate chapter, but it's the it's that's that's really the end of the story for me um and it teaches poetry and mm -hmm. i you had already given me some excellent um uh phonological tips to improve my latin pronunciation at the time um but you were still learning uh latin which was in a really interesting situation and then mm -hmm. and i was so excited for you to get there because you've been pronouncing latin with all the phonemic vowel lengths you already knew enough about you know japanese and conceptually how to do it mm -hmm. uh so you're doing it perfectly so when you got to the poetry and I think I have the recording somewhere and I want to find it because I wanted to, to hear you actually recite. Um, it was the non Negonobilium, I think, or it was maybe it was the Cthulhu. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was and, that bit. Yeah. And you just read it the same way you were reading the text from the, 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 from the chapter from the prose part of the text. Mm -hmm. And your recitation was 100% perfect, it was flawless. <laughs> you were, and you were preserving meter simply because you we're reading the language with phonemic vowel length from the very beginning right. and incorporating that into your, in your speech. And it was the, a wonderful proof of concept that if one <laughs> learns with phonemic vowel length from the beginning, Latin or ancient Greek or Japanese, you know, whatever it is, then you don't have to relearn it later as something right. additional. And so I actually want to bring up the example of, of Japanese um, mm. because so, and vowel length in particular, right, is something that, Many people say it's not worth worrying about at all in terms of Latin um, because it's too difficult, right? And usually these are people who are speakers of Western European languages that don't distinguish vowel length or not in a way that's sort of independent of, of semi-independent of stress in the way that it is in Latin, um, where both long and short vowels can be either, sorry, where both stressed and unstressed vowels can be either long or short. Um, and so, and and it's precisely the, the same kind of, I guess, intimidation um because everybody knows i think that in theory it's part of how the poetry works but what people are really saying is not that you wouldn't get anything out of it if you learned it because they would still press that button if they could press that button i think 99 percent of people what they're saying is that it's too difficult it's not worth it um but the reality is um so you know i studied japanese in university in the very first few lessons our teachers taught us a bunch of native English speakers for the most part, not exclusively, but pretty much, um, how to distinguish between long and short vowels in a way that's completely independent, independent of stress because there is no stress in Japanese, there's pitch. Um, and why did they teach this to us? Because you literally will not be understood if you don't distinguish, you know, koko means here in Japanese and koko means high school, right? Mm. Um, if you can't make those, that distinction, you will not be understood. There's so many words where you just will not be understood. Yeah. And it's not that difficult to learn. It's not that difficult to teach. It just takes a bit of teaching of what you're doing with your mouth and a bit of practice and a bit of feedback and a bit of um, input and listening to the language. And every single person, all of whom are, are native English speakers, all of whom certainly have a varying degree of ability to naturally pick this stuff up, all of them have it. Right, all of them accurately pronounce long and short vowels all the time in Japanese, and so in the context of um, Latin, I well, I'm sympathetic to the fact that this isn't how it's been done for the most part, and so it's difficult to change the institutions such that this is taught. Um, once that's in place, everyone can acquire it, and it can be really helpful especially when studying meter later on. It just makes everything so much easier to understand. The most important part of, yeah. of the classics is being able to appreciate the poet. That's, that's my biased mm -hmm. opinion, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it's once you get opinion. there, mm -hmm. once you get there, it's like, oh, right. this is life-changing. This is the best thing I've ever been able to, you know, it's great. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I've, obviously I, I agree, of course, mm -hmm. you and I are agree. And then, you know, <laughs> A funny, yeah. a funny sort of uh, additional example of this is is pitch accent in Japanese, mm. which is an example of unlike the vowel length thing, oh, you can speak like Japanese without. Oh, I, my pitch accents are all wrong. I, I could, I could do the Hashi example. That's but, about uh, it. <laughs> but um, yeah. 
people, so this is an example of something that, you know, I have been trying to study on my own because it wasn't really taught to me. Um, and it's not taught because you can actually speak. And as long as there's context, people will understand what you're saying, although you'll sound awkward and you might be misunderstood if you say individual words with the wrong pitch accent. But so because you can speak Japanese and be understood while ignoring pitch accent, and because it does take some know-how in order to teach it and some effort in order to learn it, people say the exact same thing. Oh, it's not worth worrying about. It's not worth studying. Um, but the reality is, um, then if you look at a language like Chinese, right? So, so tone and pitch accent are just two different ways of doing a very similar thing. It's distinguishing meaning through pitch, right? Every single Chinese learner has to learn the tones if you don't learn the tones to a decent degree, not perfectly, but to a decent degree, my impression, although I'm not a Chinese speaker, but my impression is that you will be hard to understand if you just completely ignore tone. If you speak yeah. Chinese atonally, you will be very hard to understand. And so everybody studies it from, from the beginning and everybody acquires it, maybe not perfectly, but like to a decent degree. Um, every single Chinese learner who like, who actually studies it and goes the distance and really learns the language. And so it's just yet another example of, well, these guys are doing it because they have to. We technically don't have to to achieve our specific goals, but it will help us to, to incorporate some of what they're doing over there. So let's do that. And so, you know, that's my attitude in terms of teaching pitch, pitch accent in Japanese comparing to, say, Chinese. And that's my attitude in terms of teaching vowel length in Latin as compared to Japanese. So, yeah, mm. this is a common issue, I think. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're uh, lagging for us just a bit, Raf, at least uh, mm. on, on my end, you are hopefully. You're... Was I comprehensible or? Yeah, you're still comprehensible. We're still lagging <laughs> a bit, but uh, I think this is a. Uh, a quick one here. Does IPA specify what type of rounding is necessary to pronounce a vowel, namely protrusion mm. and compression? Um, I'm pretty sure yeah. the answer is yes. Yeah. Well, so IPA can IPA has all sorts of diacritics that you can use to distinguish um, very minute differences. Although, of course, there's actually infinite variation to how a given sound can be um, produced in practice. It's just there isn't infinite variation in terms of the distinctions that we can hear. And so at a certain level, the differences become so minute that it actually doesn't matter because even native speakers vary within a range and all of that sounds native, right? All of that is like within the range of, of how the language is pronounced. Um, but so this is an example of, of a difference that is actually audible if you train yourself to hear it. The difference between rounding as in u or compression as in the Japanese u sound. Um, so like when I say, I don't know, uh, kuru, kuru in Japanese. The vowel is, it's not kuru, right? Um, the, the vowel is also slightly more, uh, a little bit more fronted, um, but there's a distinction between compression, uh, you can see my lips are sort of, I'm exaggerating, but my lips sort of flatten out as opposed to rounding, uh, as opposed to being relaxed, which is, uh, right, where my lips aren't doing anything. Um, the IPA can distinguish that when you need it to with diacritics, um, but that's a perfect example of the thing where it's just not worth worrying about unless your language has that. So for instance, if you're studying Japanese and you see the little compressed lips mark, uh, in the context of the U vowel, that's like then an important thing to say, oh, what is that? What does that mean? What, what is this describing in terms of what a mouth actually does to make the sound? And once you learn that, then you can pronounce words like kuru, kuru, as opposed to kuru, or kuru, or however you might naturally pronounce it on your, on your, <laughs> on your native language. Um, yeah. Kuru no. Kuru no. Yeah. <laughs> I missed, missed Japanese a bit. Uh, Raf, you're uh, lagging just a wee little bit. I wonder if, uh, the, mm -hmm. if, you, if you could uh, diagnose that. If, uh, I, know if, someone, uh, if you I mean, I have, uh, my connection is supposedly. Oh, completely... oh it's solid. Solid now. You're fine now. Okay. So this went away. Okay, cool. Uh, we got. I could leave and come back. No, no, no you, you're good now. Uh, sorry, for, sorry, I interrupted you. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get to all of your questions. Thanks everybody for your questions and comments. This is great. I'm really happy we have all this. Uh, asking about about a gun. I can't pronounce your name very well. Were secondary accents uh, before in clerics ever pronounced as in modern Greek with emphasis on additional stress? 
or before loss of pitch with the rising tone. We were just talking about this. Um, uh, There's a couple different ways that one could yeah. interpret this. Well, do you want to say something about it, Luke? No, I, I uh, because we need to actually make a video about this. I think it's probably mm -hmm. best for our, for our listeners to patiently wait for us to make the video we promised yeah. over a year ago that we'd make about pitch accent, where we discussed how, to, <laughs> how we would do this. Um, yeah. We'll make it. We'll make it next month. We'll do yes. Yes. We'll do okay. a, a pitch accent video. All right. We'll do. We'll do that. Um, my, I would say probably the new accent that's being added to it is the one that ought to be observed more than the original natural word or the original word accent. That would be exactly. my really simple way to say it right now. But we need to do a whole video to talk about because there's a lot of possibilities. Um, I would say learn the spelling really well along, along with long vowels. So at least you can apply whatever you hmm. learn uh, later. All right, I'm catching up here. I'm at five uh, at 5 p.m. and 16 minutes moving forward here trying to get um, did I not, did I say, I'm pretty sure I probably said y'all I've lived in Alabama. I've lived in the South. I'm okay. It's, a... <laughs> I mean, I say y'all I'm from Boston. So <laughs> no, it's convenient. That's other you yeah, guys. Right. And y'all's a little, I think y'all's going to win. Craig mm. asks, uh, why do we have such variations? Is it because people just hear each other differently? So variations in a native language. Can you, uh, why do you have such variations? It's because people just hear each other differently. General hypothesis of mine. Well, I mean, I guess the question that you're really asking is why do sounds change from generation to generation? Because that's that's really what's happening, right? Is is basically when a group of so so from generation to generation of speakers, little minute changes gradually build up. So for instance, there are certain vowel sounds that I pronounce differently than my parents. For me, the word C O T and the word C A U G H T are pronounced identically. Caught right. and caught. The caught caught merge, which I do not have. Um, Luke does not have. No. And neither do my parents, right? So it's in my region at least, it's a generational difference. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Very and, common in California. And also Pin Pan right. was a merger that it, when I got so confused and I moved to San Diego and people said <laughs> if I had wait, hold on. Uh, I had oh gosh. I, I every time I try to do this, I can't find an actual pen. They're always markers. Darn it. Hold on, I'll find one. I got drawers. Okay, there's one. I'm just the worst at this. Okay, so um, people would, I remember in San Diego, I, and uh, I remember, good old Michener, Cadet Michener. Yeah, he's a B-52 pilot now. Uh, <laughs> you would have thick it at the time though. Anyway, great guy, he said, <laughs> said hey, hey, hey Ranieri, hand me that pin. I'm like pin? It's like, like a vo <laughs> I voted pin? What are you talking about? Yeah, the pin. What pin? The <laughs> pin that's in your hand. I have a pen in my hand. That's what I said, <laughs> he responded. The pin. <laughs> And I'm like, and then I started paying attention because, of course, I've been interested in language since before I, I started uh, um, my uh, Air Force ROTC training. And uh, and I noticed like, oh, my gosh, this is a Southern California merger. And I just had never heard it because you know, in most Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. um, stuff, which is also Southern California, you have a more, I think, general American pronunciation, that specific thing. It's not unique to Southern mm -hmm. California, but it was definitely there prominently. Mm -hmm. And I noticed it and I found it very interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the the sort of general concept, I guess, that has been observed um, in by you know linguistics doing linguists <laughs> doing research on this um, is that children, when they're acquiring their first language, um, prioritize the way that their peers speak, the way that other children of the same age of them speak, over the way that their parents and older individuals speak. Mm. So, so at the very beginning, when a child is very young, they're mostly acquiring for language from their parents. Um, but once they start coming into extensive contact with other children, um, they will model the way that they speak based on other children. And so this is how you get these generational differences that, that spread, right, each mm. generation. And then the other thing is that every um, time language is transmitted, um, from one generation to the next, in the same way that uh, biological organisms have mutations, right? Well, language also has mutations. It's not acquired from parents perfectly. It's acquired through your brain takes in massive amounts of input and it basically builds a grammar of the language. Um, this is somewhat controversial stuff, but but let's pretend that it's not controversial for, for a second. Um, your, your brain basically builds a model of the language in your head based on that input. Um, but you have different sources of input. You interpret different pieces of input differently. Sometimes maybe you mishear things. Um, so everybody maybe remembers 
especially English speakers do this all the time, they'll say a word and other speakers will be like, what? And it turns out that you've just been pronouncing that word wrong your whole life because you- I mean, it's not you, volcano. You it or... <laughs> I said that as a kid, because this, this shows Aww. the degree of, of my youthful arrogance where I, in, I, someone said it was Vulcan and not Bulkus. No, it's Bulkan with the butt. And I didn't, I didn't, I was, was that the stupidest that, thing ever? That's adorable. But it's very me, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so often these mutations, quote unquote, will disappear once, language, once children come into contact with other children because they'll remodel their speech based on how everyone else talks. But sometimes rather than the person with the new feature remodeling their speech based on other people, other people will remodel their speech based on the person with the new feature, right? And so in precisely that manner, this feature that has developed sort of spontaneously through mutation, through maybe a mishearing or just some other process in, in the brain that's sort of impossible to really understand um, with our current scientific knowledge, that will then get spread to all of these other kids and voila, you have, you know, a new way of speaking for just this tiny Analysis little in Greek thing. or English. Right, exactly. And so these changes are often imperceptibly small initially. Like until I learned about this in my linguistics courses, I had no idea that the way that I pronounced caught and caught was different from how my parents pronounced them. I never, mm. I never, never noticed that. Or and neither did my parents until I told them I pronounced these words the same. And they were like, what? <laughs> How do you right. pronounce those the same? I mean, and that's why I think that's how certain things can get through. The very reason that I say thank instead of thank, which seems to be, uh, my mother does as well. She says thank instead of thank with a voice, the, mm -hmm. um, which is, I would go ahead and say it's not wrong. It's just a minority pronunciation. Just like the caught, caught isn't wrong instead of caught, caught, like I, I pronounce them. Mm -hmm. But I natively don't do the um, three-way uh, Mary, Mary, Mary. And I'm doing them the way I natively do. But I'm mm -hmm. able to train myself to say, uh, the, like the uh, Downton Abbey Mary, um, she got, she wanted to get um, married, wedded to, what was his name? I forget. So Mary, Mary, no, wait, no, Mary, Mary, darn it. Mary, uh, with an A, Mary. So May, Mary, Mary, and then Mary is happy. Mary, like the. <laughs> Are Marian all people. three of those the same for you, Luke? Yes. Are they for you? Ah, what, do you have any two of them? Two of them are the same. So I would Your say. Mother's a two way, but my dad yeah. is three way non merged. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I have the so I have Mary, um, M-E-R-R-Y versus Mary, which is either M-A-R-Y or M-A-R-R-Y. So, so the letter Mary, A is ah for both. The name and yeah, exactly. So I have Mary so and cool. Mary. Yeah. yeah. And I think the reason that the variations can coexist for a while is that we don't really notice until we get confused. Um, mm. Like with a pin pen, that was an example where I got confused. And then, mm. then there becomes some kind of social pressure where if there's a confusion, people make fun of each other. People, and then that will develop and out through generations mm. to become one version or the other, either a breaking apart or a, more likely, I think, of uh, fusing together of the sounds. But it depends, I guess. And mm -hmm. oh, the other one that I was thinking of is the rare thing with the a ah versus a, ah is that um, some uh, people, uh, older people in this region, I think it's still native in Brooklyn, distinguish can from a can, a can is uh, a receptacle, um, and, whereas can is the verb. I can, I can open a can. My dad yeah. does that. I didn't know that really, that really cool 19, I think a 1957 uh, TV episode where there's some linguist, someone basically like you is talking about all these cool variations in American English, which are different at that mm. time. Uh, Craig thanks you, by the way. <laughs> and thank you. also thank you, um, I have to pronounce your name. Uh, Abedonergo, thank you very much. I hope I pronounced that adequately for being a member today and for as long as you like to be. I really appreciate it. Joe Lingvist, how you doing? Good to see you. You ask, what are the best CI resources for Spanish? I believe it's Destinos. Uh, if you just Google that, you should find the website right away. Destinos, like destiny, mm -hmm. but instead of a Y at the end, it's OS, Destinos. And if mm -hmm. you write a comment later on the video after it gets posted and you can't find it, I'll be happy to post a link mm -hmm. there. The uh, uh, yeah. the other mm -hmm. thing that I would recommend is um, a much more recent thing, which is this YouTube channel called Dreaming in Spanish. Ah, oh, that's good. Um, where there's this guy and he basically makes tons of uh, comprehensible input videos. He's on camera, he's showing objects, he's saying the names of objects, he's drawing pictures, describing the actions that are that are happening at different levels. Um, mm, so he has, he has super beginner videos, which are for people who know literally no, no Spanish, and you'll still understand what he's saying in a video based on what he does on screen. There's beginner, there's intermediate, there's advanced. Um, 
you know, I already spoke Spanish when I <laughs> found his channel, but uh, I always recommend that to people who ask me for resources for learning Spanish. Definitely check mm. that out. Tremendous. Um, is it time to talk about Retracted S? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, can, I, I can always, uh, let's see how, how much I can condense this. Um, OK. I can, I can do the introduction, and you can Go for it. Cle clean up. Uh, OK. Um, usually, if a language has a sh sound, which, by the way, isn't the same. I just uh, watched a YouTube video guy. Was, he was an American English speaker, but instead of saying sh and ch, he was saying sh and ch, much more retracted, like Russian. Hmm. But that's a variation within English. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, and his S was more abstracted anyway. But I think he was, I was guessing, I thought maybe from Chicago, but he saw it was speaking basically general American, like North, upper Midwest mm -hmm. pronunciation. Anyway, um, but if there is a sh sound in a language, usually what that will do is because um, the sound of S, just like any of these sounds, can be variable in any speaker or group of speakers. Um, uh, for example, Sean Connery is a native English speaker, Sean, right? Sean but Sean Connery <laughs> and Patrick Stewart, both of them, but they have a more attracted sh, if the tongue is more tighter, sh, which gives more space for the s to come mm. back. So they say the torpedoes, number one, you know, mm. like Patrick Stewart will pronounce, or mm. um, sh, you know, shake and not stirred, sort of mm. sh, so there's, and so when there's a sh, usually that pushes the S sound forward as it does in mm. Italian. And I think the majority of in native English speakers Mm -hmm. uh, to have a s, which is more laminal. It, I, I realize it, this is how I describe it, and, and please clean up for me linguistically here, but I realize it by bringing the tip of my tongue essentially below the lower incisors mm -hmm. for the way I natively do it, and then bring it uh, behind the top incisors, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. ends up resulting in a lower pitch. Tocate. Yeah, tocate. Okay, allora. um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual position of the, the tongue tip um, for these different S sounds, it can vary from speaker to speaker and language to language. And it's actually often, that's actually often not the important thing in terms of hearing the difference. It's how far forward or how far back the tongue is when you're making this sound that can be anywhere on a spectrum from S in, in English, or maybe even further forward in, in some languages to SH. Um, also in English, right? So in English, I have sip and then I have ship. Whereas in Spanish, when I speak Spanish or when I speak um, modern Greek, um, like if I say the word aftos, right? Aftos. Or if I say um, todos, todos, todos los seres humanos, right? In, zapatos. In, in, yeah, zapatos, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you'll notice that the, the S sound is sort of in between my English S and my English SH, SH sound, right? So it's not todos, and it's not todos, that's todos with a more English, like S would be like a more of a Latin American, depending on the on the variety, more of a Latin American pronunciation of, of Spanish. But todos, sort of between the two, um, is how peninsular, like European Spanish tends to sound. And um, this is just sort of a, a phonetic detail that's kind of fun to work on if you're really into the idea of like trying as best as possible to reconstruct the, the ancient sound of, of Latin. But if that's what you're into, which is what I'm into, um, then basically um, there's a couple of different sources of, of evidence. So one is that, so as Luke was mentioning, languages that have a sh sound um, as well as an s sound tend to have an s that's more fronted, that's more like s. And the reason is that if you have s and sh, they're very close together in the mouth. And so you you naturally, um, you know, speakers of a language naturally over time, if they have sounds that are too clustered together and they have space to push them apart, they will generation to generation because it's more efficient. Your brain is better at distinguishing sounds that are more different. Um, and so the other piece of evidence is that across Indo-European languages, which are all you know languages that descend from one common ancestor five to six thousand years ago in the Central Asian steppe, so that's everything from the Celtic languages to the Germanic languages to the Italic languages to Greek to the Slavic languages, Baltic, Albanian, Armenian, Indic, uh, um, Iranian, Persian. Um, I hope I got everything. Um, all of the languages that have developed a sh sound, and we can we can observe when these sh sounds develop, end up with an s that's more fronted for the most part. So in English, 
Um, I have the word shirt, right? Um, we also have the word in English skirt. It turns out that these are from the same root, right? They, they're, um, they're from the same Germanic root. Shirt is the native English word and skirt was borrowed from Old Norse, um, which was spoken by, by Vikings um, that came during the Dane law, um, which is when they were in control of parts of England and Scotland. Um, and if you listen to modern Icelandic, um, there was no, um, there was no politicization of skja before um, vowels like e or e, um, which in English ska became sha. So the original word would have been something more like skirt. And then in English, it became probably scha and then scha and then sha. Um, so if you compare, for instance, uh, the word ship, like a boat in Icelandic is skip. And skipper. Um, right. Skipper. Yeah. The skiff. Right. Exactly. Um, those are from the same root, but just from different languages that developed differently. Mm. A, um, and so Icelandic yeah. never developed a sh sound, and Icelandic has this sh, this slightly retracted s sound. You'll hear it if you ever listen to an Icelander speaking English, um, or if you just listen to Icelandic, they have this retracted s sound. Similarly, Dutch um, never really developed a sh sound yeah, through any kind cold. of palatalization. Cool. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. Or, yeah. Or um, and in Dutch, once cool. again, if you listen to Dutch speakers, they have this very prominent retracted mm. S sound. I love it. It's great. Um, there's other examples. Greek in the dialects that didn't develop a sh sound. So standard modern Greek does not have a sh sound. The S is, is retracted. Um, Sardinian, which is the only Romance language that didn't develop a sh sound because it didn't undergo palatalization. So Sardinians still say um, conoscere, conoscere for conoscere in Italian. Um, and they, in, in particularly the more conservative dialects that have taken on less influence from, from Italian, still have this sh sound. Um, mm. And so all throughout the Indo-European languages, there's more examples. Um, you find that the languages that didn't develop a sh or don't have a sh have this more retracted s. And so what that points to is that that's the original inherited sound throughout all branches of Indo-European. And then many languages underwent palatalization processes to develop sh, and then they lost that pronunciation. Um, there's other reasons we could go into for why we also would say that classical Latin in particular, which had not undergone that palatalization, has that same S sound that you hear in Sardinian or, or Spanish. Um, the story in Spanish is more complicated, although it's still very good evidence for this, but I, I don't think we have time to, I would love to talk about the history of, of sibilant sounds in Spanish in another video. Let's do I mean, that. Let's do yeah. that. That'd be cool. And I wanted cool. to add to... Oh, we should do it just a video on, <laughs> on retracted S. Retracted because it's, it. such a, it's such a meme at this point. But, do uh, it. We got time. Yeah. We're going to have time real soon. We're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I want to add those of you out there. Are, I, thanks, everyone. for your, These questions are great. And we're going to try to answer... And your comments are really great, too. I'm trying to answer as many... Uh, as I uh, as we can uh, for today. If we don't get to them, uh, please leave a comment later on after the uh, live stream is posted, and I or Raphael mm -hmm. will uh, respond to you. And we'd we'd love to. So hope hope we can get to everything we can uh, today. Can like oh, and there's an example. Can that's a learned alteration I did to my own pronunciation. Can instead of can can, mm -hmm. which is I think people around here would say can. I say can now just because I'm in front of a camera and I do audio mm -hmm. stuff I'm like mm, I like the sound of a can but it sounds more like Patrick Stewart you know it's that kind of there's no good reason for it except that I have an aesthetic preference for it now I say aesthetic mm -hmm. instead of aesthetic which is normal I say <laughs> accept instead of accept for all these these are weird things that I started to do just for clarity I mean instead of clarity which is what I used to say clarity and I say I would say clarity so I'm just making fun of myself because I'm Hyperconscious about pronunciation. Raphael has no problem, however, being completely himself. <laughs> and uh, good, good on him for that. I'd say. Uh, let's see. This is a, an easy one, I think, to answer. Right? How do we know which syllable is stressed in the IPA system? Got a little tick that's to the left of it. Yeah. There's a, so there's a little. It almost looks like an apostrophe. Mm -hmm. If if you see that to the left of the stressed syllable, it means that that following syllable is stressed. So yeah. like in the English word record, the, where the re is stressed, there will be a little tick slash apostrophe looking thing right before the re. And then the word record, where the chord is stressed, 
there'll be a little apostrophe tick thing before the chord. If you go on Wiktionary or something and you type in those words, you'll see that little tick in the in the transcription. Yeah. All right, I'm still catching up here. Uh, da, 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 da. Give me a second, everyone, if you can. Oh, darn it! Oh, it cut off a whole bunch. That's what I was afraid of. That's why I try to get these earlier ones because if I if I missed your, <laughs> if you asked something before 5:36 p.m. Eastern time, I unfortunately can't look at it now because it just went away. That's a limitation. Why don't we say if anyone has any questions, just type it type it now, and then we can uh, we can try to respond to like one or two more. Well, yeah, I, well, um, well, yeah, that's a good idea. Da, 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 da. Well, I'm trying to. We also have members here, and I want to make sure we get our members. Uh, hey, again, um, uh, versus mm -hmm. a good comment. I think Raphael is the the uh, the 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 are probably palatizing in your dietier. Oh, so you're saying dietier instead of dietier. Dietier. Ah, dietier. It's it's closed, Val. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my Russian is very rusty. Dietier. And I, I think it's because of the palatization of the following consonant, right? Right. Isn't that cool? It's, I love how I learned that. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a rule. Mm. It's great. Uh, hold on, I'm skipping through here. Then, mm. um, yeah, we do. Raf's the best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're the best. Thanks, man. Uh, I'm just tagging along. Just, um. Not to learn vowel length independent of stress in Latin because it doesn't sound natural. I, uh, I think we, we addressed that, but Finns, it, I would... Finns and Hungarians and Japanese people everywhere are, are crying right now. <laughs> I mean, well, it depends. I, I've done plenty of recordings, and older Arabs ones especially, Asians where I, I overemphasize the thing in order to not necessarily sound natural, right. but for pedagogical reasons. And I w would, would go ahead and... I mean, if you listen to my recent Latin stuff, I think I have a, a more natural... Mm -hmm. fluid sound i'm also constantly studying italian in order to yeah uh, make... that's actually mm -hmm. that's a good that's a really good point yeah. um, in terms of the naturalness of, of vowel length it's true that often when a lot of people who don't have it in their native language are learning it because they hear this term long vowels they think okay i have to take the vowels that i already have and make them longer yeah. and so you get you know people saying like you know consonance, right, or something, or uh, romanos, or whatever. Really like hammer it or something, the way I used to do when Whereas, I was trying to pedagogically emphasize it. Right, exactly, try to emphasize it yeah. so people can hear it. But if you listen to a language with vowel length, the key is not to make your long vowels long, it's to make your short vowels really yes, short. Right. Yeah. So, for instance, like, in ago, Japanese... Fero. Oh, yeah, go ahead, ago. Japanese. Yeah. Or, yeah, or in Japanese, you know, koko, right here, koko. Mm -hmm. It's not koko. Because if it's, if, you know, it's not, I don't say koko for here and then koko for high school. I say koko for here and koko for high school. Mm. And koko, I mean, that's a perfectly sayable normal word with long vowels. Koko. koko. Yeah. The key is to koko distinguish is to say koko very, very, you know, uh, get that, that sort of staccato rhythm down. Mm. Um, yes. Thank you, um, PMT Lynch for being a member. Really appreciate it. Thanks. That's kind of you. Uh, Ioanni, uh, this is uh, Ioanni's usually, uh, Ioanni's usually frequents the um, inch Greek through Latin on Scorpio Martianos. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. This is a really complicated question, which if you write in the comments, I think we could get to it. So, so thanks very much uh, for, because we'd love, we'd love to, but that's a, whew, I think that's a big mm -hmm. uh, question. Uh, do Trudging forward, everyone. Doom, uh, and this is this is me making making vamping sound. This vamp. Uh, oh, hey, we we you and you say thank as well. All right, All right, the No, it's spreading. No, I'm kidding. No, it's I'm been around. Not a, I'm I think not a it's well, my uh, no. <laughs> You're you're, not, you're going to prescribe yourself not to be a, a prescriptivist, even <laughs> if it kills you. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, or thank, 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 or th or you're a thank or. Um, yeah, the, thus it's basically because um, if you look at other Western Germanic languages like uh, Dutch or, or German, it's it's dank or danke with a duh, right? It would, basically, there's two kinds of um, there's there's a certain they, they derive from a the or a th sound, and there was different in the different varieties of older Germanic languages, and it it seems, and I'm absolutely not a specialist in this. We should probably ask Jackson Crawford or someone. Mm -hmm. um, that the uh, that certain Germanic languages had the unvoiced version, and one of them I think was Anglish, the Angle language, the Angles language, whereas the West Saxon, the West Saxon had the more the, so the versus the, at least for that word. 
And English is an example, just like every language where we have a mix. We we're just talking with Davide today about bachos from basho from basium um, hmm. as a weird little thing that ends up now at standard. Um, in my case, my pronunciation of thank isn't standard because I say, well, I guess thank, I think that's the less standard thing because we have, we have this and that. I would anticipate thank to be standard, but it's not well, because this, of the dominance this and of that. that are, um are generally unstressed uh, function why. words, which is why you have the voicing there. Because of course, the comes from the originally in Old English. So that was unvoiced, it became voice. Ah, voicing came mm -hmm. Do you think my um, thing is, is innovative later uh, during the thank? infusion? Thank I think thank. Thank, thank is later than thank, definitely. Because in Old, I mean, in Old English, but it's in there Western, was no... no it's Saxon. In, in, well, in Old, in, old, uh, in Standard, West Saxon, there was actually no phonemic difference between the and the. Hmm. The it was just distributional. What about fox and um, and the other one, vixen? Vixen, right? So vixen comes from a different dialect than uh, West than... Saxon, old West, West Saxon, right? No, I think vixen comes from. Oh, okay. I well, I'm, dialect, I'm, but... I'm definitely not the expert. I'm going to ask. Uh, you should, you should ask. Uh, we should ask. Jackson Crawford. We should or, definitely uh, do that. <laughs> uh, we let... should maybe do one more question, and then I think, uh, unfortunately, you're right. Hold on, let me let me yeah. scan scan through here. Give me a second. And thanks so much, everyone, as I'm going through this for all your comments and questions. Looks like you had some good discussion here in the comments as well. And again, please, we didn't get the chance to uh, cover your your question. Graf, hey, thanks for coming to member. I appreciate that, my friend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if we uh, uh, don't get to uh, your, your questions or comments uh, today, then, that, not then, then, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, oh, look, hey, it's Marina. Hey, how you doing? Salve. Uh, and uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. I think, whew, I hope we, we got some of the questions. No, I don't see any questions. I, but I rushed through like 20 minutes of comments. Um, oh. Why do some linguists claim that Latin had two sets of O and U sounds that were similar to the ones in English? Um, we, we, were just, we were just talking about uh, the... Oh, I was talking about this um, in the Latin chat yesterday, which is why I was thinking I had just talked about this. And I was using the vowel chart. So I will... If it, <laughs> I'll go do a little bit of this. Well, if there's one more question for, for, uh, <laughs> for Raf here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so this is, this is how... It's understood, and Raffle definitely has a lot of good comments on this as well. Hmm. Um, so the the prescribed way on, say, Wikipedia or Wiktionary for the pronunciation of Latin words is based on Sidney Allen's model. And Raff mm -hmm. and I don't agree with everything about it, nor does Dr. Calabrese, even J. N. Adams has statistical evidence which demonstrates mm -hmm. why we have some evidence, that, or I think considerable evidence, not to go along with a specific thing, which is that there ought to be, according to Sidney Allen and others, philologists from the past, as well as some modern folks, um, a distinction between short E and long E, the short letter I and the long letter I, and the short U and long U. They would say U uh, for the short one, like lupus, instead of lupus. And instead of E, they would say um, um, igitur instead of igitur. I, now, I don't think there's anything linguistically wrong with that as being a possibility, but I strongly hmm. disagree with it being... Lithuanian is an example of a language oh. with... Basically, that vowel system. You have yeah. the long vowels that are e u. You have the the mm -hmm. short vowels that are. I mean, they're not exactly like English i and u, but they're similar. They're laxish. Um, yeah, they're closer to this this one. Exactly. Um, so it's that said. Um, I think yeah, just the modern evidence in the classical period at least it doesn't point to that. It, it points to um, five qualities: e e uh, e e um, a a o o. I'm doing long and short vowels. Uh, ooh, ooh, right. So each right. pair has the same length, which is a system preserved in Sardinian, for instance, all the long and short vowels merge. Um, right. The reason why they say that there's different qualities is because ignoring for a second what they're saying those qualities were, it is actually clear that in the vast majority of Latin, by the end of the classical period, there were differences in um, first in the quality of long E and short e. So instead of e and e, you had e and e, probably, which is um, equivalent basically to what you have in Italian, where the the descendant of long e is pronounced e, and the descendant of short e is pronounced e or ye mm -hmm. in some contexts. Right. And you have the same thing with o and o, 
um, the long one raises, it becomes O, right? Right. And then uh, that's why in Italian, it's part of the reason why in Italian you have a dis- difference between O and O. And then right. at the same time, in Italian and the vast majority of Romance languages, short E and short U lower to join that new close mid quality E and O. So that's why... Do you think the raising um, happened first before the um, short vowel? Quality the raising, change. I do believe it happened first. Yes, mm, that's, that's, that's what I think the, the evidence points to. Calabrese goes into that. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think... Yeah. Um, so, so basically, it, it is true that short E and U at one point have to have lowered such that they were pronounced E and O. There doesn't necessarily have to have been an intermediate stage of E and O. Right. Um, There's nothing been... wrong with that as linguistic theory, but mm-hmm. um, what Rath and I and Calabrese say is it's simply not necessary. And to prescribe mm-hmm. it is the mm-hmm. other problem with prescribing it. And it also it, probably it, wasn't already true in the classical period. The that's other thing. the thing. We disagree the... with the dating. Right, because the, uh, yeah. there's inscriptional evidence which demonstrates all of those changes we just are. There's definitely a change of vowel sounds during in when Latin is a native language, but not from the time period of reconstructed mm-hmm. classical Latin phonology, which is the first century right. BC, first century AD through the end of the second century. What we see is that mm-hmm. the beginnings of spelling errors for front vowels is second century, but none of the back vowels. And it yeah, seems the back that, vowels are later. Are later. Yeah. yeah, and the uh, Eastern Romance, like Romanian, possibly because of, of the push from uh, Trajan's time and the, the colonization of Dacia, or maybe not. The point is that Eastern Romance languages like Aromanian and, Rom- and Romanian don't have the back vowel changes. They don't change a- even au. It's still aur for gold, mm-hmm. whereas it's oro in Italian. Right. So the back vowels they only change. They only change the front vowels like Italian. And right. that's consistent with an inscriptional evidence. Um, and it's also consistent. So it, so it also, there's actually a good a deal of evidence which... Um, uh, is not reflected in these earlier reconstructions done by, say, Sidney Allen. There's a good deal of evidence that the lowering of short e was initially only in word final syllables in an, in an unstressed context, and then it spread to the rest of the word. So in modern Italian, so like in Latin, you have siccus, right, dry. Um, in modern Italian, it's secco. In Sardinian, it's siccu, right? Um, so preserving the original uh, qualities. And so that lowering happens universally to short E in, or pretty much universally, universally to short E in Italian and, and most of Romance. Um, but there's a good deal of evidence that it happened first only at the ends of words. And actually, mm-hmm. one very good piece of evidence uh, that I discovered myself, I haven't seen anyone else mention this, although it's probably in some handbook in Italian somewhere that I haven't read. But um, Sardinian actually has a lowering of short E to E um, in syllable final position. So normally when you read a description of Sardinian, uh, people say it preserves short E and short U. That's actually not true um, in words like Tibe from Tibi or Ube from Ubi. Um, There's a bunch of other examples of this. Also in the verb conjugations, you see this. Um, And this is consistent with inscriptions from Pompeii. Uh, and other places where we see a in place of e in this very predictable pattern of um, of word final position, uh, and then slowly spreading to other positions. So yeah, I think if you really not very many people now are actually care about this, which is why all of the stuff you see in the internet is based on Sidney Allen, um, which is right. fine. I mean, it's a, it's a great piece of scholarship, but uh, if people actually look at the evidence, I think there are very few linguists. Who would not be? I mean, you know, I'm I'm biased because it's it's my own position, but uh, I think there are very few linguists who would look at all the evidence if they had the time and the inclination, and who would not say, "Oh, okay, you're right. It probably wasn't pronounced the way Sidney Allen is is describing." But yeah, and and ultimately the the evidence, J. N. Adams, uh, his books really demonstrate that. Second century onward is when the front vowel changes happen, but not the back vowels until the fourth century A.D. Classical Latin is centuries before that especially if we're going for something very specifically of Ciceronian, if you want to. It doesn't mean you can't attempt later pronunciations. I think that's great. But that's usually not what people are even attempting to do when they speak Latin with a classical Latin pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So um, the evidence just doesn't support the conclusion that there there necessarily is based on spelling errors uh, and other other things. And so I I aim for the the simpler one. I like it aesthetically as well. I don't blame a single person who wants to use a Sidney Allen system. We can all communicate. Mm -hmm 
just totally. fine. Uh, Yuani, you asked a good question, which we don't have time for, but we should do a whole podcast, <laughs> a whole chat, I think, Rafa, on this. Why is it hard to hide our accent when speaking another language? Um, I don't think we can answer that today. Do you agree with me? Well, we sort of did answer that. I mean, yeah, I guess we did. You know, there's there's transfer from your native language. That's how you've had, that's how you've acquired language initially, and it takes a bit of training. Just like how it takes a bit of training, you know, if you're an Italian learning Spanish, the grammar is very easy to learn. If you're an Italian learning Japanese, the grammar takes a lot of study and practice to learn because it's very very. La henda ne. But with study and practice, you can learn any grammar. And that includes phonology. And so the more different from your native way of pronouncing it is, the more explicit study it will take, the more awareness you need to, ph phonetic and phonological awareness you need to develop to then benefit from immersion and input to then pronounce the language with that pronunciation. Um, but it's always feasible, even if you're learning a language that's extremely different from the languages you already speak, it's feasible. So, yeah. Absolutely. If you okay. want to learn, phonology as well as beginner latin spanish or italian from one of the most knowledgeable people i know rafael turigiano this is his website rturigiano.wordpress.com where you can sign up for his lessons um I, I i would not like i said in the beginning i wouldn't be where i am today i wouldn't be able going to be in grado di talk about <laughs> what I, I am able to talk about uh today without uh having benefited from the lessons that you've given me over all these years. So uh, definitely give it give it a shot. Thanks so much, everyone, for all your comments, questions. If you have more, yes. uh, we'll, over the months, even years, perhaps, that if, if you write comments, whenever you see this in the future, uh, love to get uh, get back to you if you have something about this subject. And we'll have Raf back, I think, for another one. Raf, thank you so much for being here and, and doing thank this. Thank you so and much for having me. Amazing insights. Yeah, thanks, it's man. always so much fun. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll thank you one. to uh, everyone. Yeah, 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 definitely. Mm. Nah, nah. Grazie a tutti, eh? Mm. Grazie, Suobis. I'll go. <laughs> ah, sì, uh, sì, sì. Servo nostri, eres latinos. Recte, recte, dijis. Valete, omnes, valete. Valete. Bye-bye.